Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the meeting of our RASP, Research Analysis of Standardization Processes, Proposed Research Group. Uh, let's start with the boring part where the rest of the people finishes their coffees. So as uh, any other IRTF group, uh, the IITF uh, Intellectual Property Rights Supply, and you can check this uh, on the appropriate RFCs. Uh, what is RASP about? RASP is about understanding the standardization, uh, the standardization process uh, via evidence-based reproducible work. Uh, we are open to all kinds of works in this space. Uh, the type of outputs includes uh, joint reports, papers, uh, tool, data, and open source software. Actually, we have uh, some of those talking about uh, today. Uh, what RASP is not about is about making hierarchical conversations between standard development organizations. The point of RASP is not to say the ITF is great and the WBCDC is not, or anything of the sort, or directly influence ITF operations, though, of course, people are very welcome to take whatever findings they see here and interpret them in whichever way they find appropriate. Uh, the chairs are Niels, who could not make it today, and myself. And, of course, you can find much more information on the data tracker. Uh, do we have any note taker? Any volunteer? Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, scan the QR code and uh, for the questions and answers, use Meet Echo so uh, our note taker does not struggle in capturing your names. So that would be really, really appreciated. Uh, the speakers, uh, please leave enough time to for uh, question and answers. Uh, that's ultimately your responsibility. If there is not enough time, there won't be questions and you will just deliver your presentation. So I think it's much better to have a bit of a discussion. Uh, presenters, please get ready uh, before uh, your presentation during the question and answers. That would be great. Uh, I'm hearing that there is a lot of feedback in the room. I'm afraid there is very little I can do. The speaker seems to capture even the blink of my eyes. <laughs> uh, is this better, Nick? Now that it's a bit far away? Okay. Uh, I will try to be ruthless in timekeeping. Uh, I will try to help the speakers by telling you when it's uh, five minutes and 10 minutes so you can keep control, but uh, I might forget. So it's ultimately your responsibility. Uh, and that is all. Uh, we have a pretty cool agenda. Uh, we have first Carolina talking about the internet standards tracker. Uh, then we will have Sebastian uh, talking about the new capabilities of Big Bang. Uh, then Susan Harz, uh, by the way, many apologies if I mispronounce your names. I mispronounce many things in English as well. So who is going to be talking about consensus decision making on the IESG. Uh, then uh, Matthew Russell Barnes uh, is going to continue with communication patterns in the ITF. And uh, finally, Nick Merrill is going to be talking about uh, CDNs and states. And that is the agenda. And uh, if the next speaker can... Uh, approach the microphone.
Fantastic. So thank you very much, Carolina. Uh, Carolina and Nathan online that can now unmute. I see you now unmuted and I see you now in the screen. Uh, perfect. Okay, so cool. let me share your slides. Thank you. While you do that, uh, so hi everyone. My name is Carolina Cairo. I am uh, with the DNS Research Federation and I'm uh, joined by my colleague Nathan Allen, who's online. Nathan, do you want to say hi before we get started? Also, we yep, can test yep. your mic again. Cool. It works. <laughs> do you want to say hi? Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, it's um, nice to, nice to be with you all today. My name's Nathan Allen. I'm the uh, Director of Engineering at the DNS uh, Research Federation. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. So this is actually our first uh, presentation um, at IRTF and IDF. So we're very excited to be here. Um, so I'll give you a second, Ignacio, to get the slides on the screen. Thank you. Um, so today we'll be presenting the uh, Internet uh, Standards Tracker, which is uh, a tool we have developed um, at the DNS Research Federation. Um, I will say a word about the, the DNS Research Federation as well as an organization. Like many of us uh, here in the room, we're in the business of uh, making sense of the internet through data. Um, and uh, essentially what we do is, you know, we encourage and, and facilitate uh, uh, database uh, research on the DNS and standards and how um, they connect to cyber policy issues. And I was going to ask you to go on to the next slide, but I have the clicker so I can do that myself. Um, so to get started, um, the Internet Standards Tracker um, that we'll be you know, presenting to you today is part of a larger initiative called the Internet Standards Observatory. Um, so I'll say a few words about that first. Um, so the Internet Standards Observatory is an initiative we're doing with funding from the Internet Society and the RIPE NCC, uh, the Internet Society Foundation, I should say. And um, our uh, goal with the observatory is to prevent uh, internet fragmentation of the internet's uh, core. Um, what we are looking to do is essentially support um, standards participants um, in identifying standard proposals um, that um, could potentially uh, challenge uh, interoperability on the internet or that, you know, sort of propose, um, you know, to sort of transform um, how we do addressing naming, uh, networking, and, and routing on uh, the internet. Um, so why tracking internet standards? Um, so our sense was that um, internet standards development is a, a bit, uh, you know, in a, you could say, you know, a pivotal, you know, point in time in that, you know, we're seeing lots of conversations about um, uh, sort of ways to evolve the internet to um, uh, sort of adjust it or adapt it to the needs of future networks and future technologies. And we find that, you know, those conversations, those discussions uh, merit active engagement from the community. And, you know, we wanted to sort of innovate in ways of, of facilitating uh, that engagement in that conversation. Um, there's also sort of the well-documented uh, barrier to sort of participation or engagement in standards, um, which is, you know, how time and resource intensive it is to uh, engage in SEOs. I think, you know, any of us, um, you know, um, you know, preparing to attend ITF would, you know, empathize <laughs> um, with, with that sort of, you know, feeling of, you know, how, how, how much time you actually have to sort of invest to, to be able to participate in the spaces. So with uh, standards tracking, we're, you know, hoping to sort of assist, again, standards participants in identifying critical proposals that they might want to prioritize for uh, engagement. Um, and lastly, um, you know, and this is for me a very important point, um, you know, we find that SEOs are actually an opportunity to make the internet better. Um, so again, you know, we, we hope that the, the, the tracking of internet standards is a way of sort of encouraging uh, thorough conversations about how we want the internet to, to evolve, you know, what internet we, we want. Um, and also, you know, uh, sort of shed light um, on um, you know, whether we're discussing internet standards um, in the right fora where they can get, you know, the proper technical scrutiny where they actually open uh, to sort of feedback and, and, and uh, sort of uh, vetting from, uh, you know, the larger multi-stakeholder community even. Uh, last word on the Standards Observatory, I already mentioned um, our funders, um, ISOC um, and RIPE. Um, and in terms of what we offer, we have the Standards Tracker, uh, which is a bit sort of the, the heart really of the Internet Standards Observatory and uh, the tool that I'll be showing you in just one second. Um, just to sort of caveat the work that we do with a tracker, um, our focus is on standards that are currently under development. We don't focus on standards that have been approved in their degree of sort of adoption or deployment. 
Um, and our SEOs of focus are ITUT, which is the standardization arm of uh, the International Telecommunications Union. Um, that's the tracker that's ready, that's available on our site and the one that I'll be showing you today. Um, we are in the process of developing the tracker for IETF that's uh, in the works and hopefully we'll be sharing that, you know, possibly in this group um, at a later point in time. And we'll also be um, producing a tracker for ETSI, um, which stands for European Telecommunication Standards Institute. Um, I did want to say as well that beyond sort of the, the standards tracker we, we are offering, we're focusing as well on um, sort of producing, generating knowledge to better understand standardization spaces and ecosystem, the, the standardization ecosystem. So we are um, supporting um, academic research, uh, partly, you know, with, with the funding from the Internet Society. Um, and we're also uh, going to be putting out a series of blog articles that I'll, you know, be presenting uh, again later in the presentation. But now on to, the, 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 you know, what we really wanted to show you, which is the standards tracker. Um, so we actually thought of doing a, a demo, a live demo for uh, this presentation, but we weren't sure whether that was, you know, within the rules. So we'd gone for uh, screenshots, but this is actually um, available on our uh, website, on the DNSRF uh, website. And I will ask my colleague Nathan to, you know, share that in the chat um, so that you can access it. So essentially what you, what you see here is our tracker. Um, as I mentioned, we have it available for ITUT at the moment. And at the top of the screen is um, the study groups that we are tracking. Uh, we're tracking study group 13 on future networks, uh, study group 16 uh, on multimedia and digital technologies, which is the study group where we saw some of the sort of work, early work on metaverse emerge um, at ITU, and also study group 17, which is the one on security. Um, I will also sort of flag, we, we started doing uh, the tracking in uh, the first quarter of 2023. So for instance, uh, for study group, which is the one that's selected now, you can actually look at contributions or standards proposals for the March and October uh, meetings. Um, in terms of what information we provide, um, you know, we, we provide sort of a, a brief sort of overview about what the standards proposals are about. So here you can see you have the title, yeah, you know, what meeting the, the standard, um, uh, you know, corresponds to the number of the contributions. So you can actually go and pull the document. We tell you who is the proponent, what the, the, the standard is about, what they're proposing for standardization and uh, the associated uh, use cases. And then on the sort of left hand side of the screen, we have a series of filters that allow you to sort of hone in um, on uh, sort of different aspects of these, um, you know, standards that we're highlighting to the community. Um, so, for instance, if you're, you know, interested in a specific use case um, or, you know, just pass on to the next one, or if, if you're interested, you know, in honing in just on your work items um, or, you know, a specific element that's being proposed for standardization, you can do that um, on, um, on sort of the left-hand uh, uh, column of, of the tracker. And I will say, um, because I forgot to say, and this is actually really important, we also do color coding um, for our uh, proposals that we highlight. So as I mentioned, you know, we want to sort of help people figure out which proposals to prioritize when they're preparing for meetings. So you'll see that we basically color code pro uh, proposals um, on uh, red for those we think are important for you know, people to engage with, uh, yellow for those that we suggest people should you know, monitor, potentially engage with as well, and then we have in green proposals that are flagged for, for tracking. So this is what the tracker looks like. Um, I've shown you the front end, so I'll now invite uh, my colleague uh, Nathan to speak about the back end of the standards tracker. Thanks, Carolina. So this is the, um, the dashboard for one of the outputs that we provide through our analytics platform. Um, and at the DNS Research Federation, we have created our own um, analytics platform in order for us to perform our own analysis. Um, and this is uh, what you're viewing here is the dashboard from one of the um, outputs of, of the system. Um, <clears throat> Caroline, if you move on to the next slide. So I'll briefly go over how the system works um, and how we're able to understand um, the context of the documents that the system um, ingests. So at the very beginning of the process, we obtain all of the documents um, for a particular meeting. Um, they are then uploaded into the system where you can um, select a number of different options for the parsing of those documents. Um, if you go to the next slide, Carolina. 
Um, once the documents are in the system, uh, what the system does is it extracts all of the um, individual words and phrases um, from all of the documents. We're then able to, in the system, tell the system exactly what we're looking for within those documents. So there may be a particular theme um, or particular keywords that you're interested in, in looking for within those um, documents. And we can do that through um, creating what we call um, custom data sets. Next slide, Carolina. And this is an example of, of one of the data sets uh, that we've added and some of the, um, the keywords um, that are of particular interest um, at, at this moment in time. Next slide. The system also allows you to create your own scoring system. So you might want to um, weight certain keywords um, higher than others, um, and you have complete flexibility in this within the system um, to give precedent over certain um, appearances of different types of keywords. Next slide. This is the raw output, um, one of the raw outputs. So you can see on the left-hand side are all the, the document file names, um, the different sections, and the phrase and the phrase length um, that has been extracted from that particular document. And what this here provides is a way for you to filter the data, for you to join in other data sets, um, and for you to perform some uh, different formulae and calculations on that. Next slide. And this is an example of what it would look like to join in additional data. Um, so at this particular point in time, you might want to add in um, the keywords, the, the list of keywords that you have found in order to reduce the set down to the keywords that are of most importance. Thank you. Next slide, Carolina. And this is what it would, would look like um, once you've performed a join with the raw data set and your keywords, where you can see here the document file name and the amount of times that a particular word has appeared in that particular document. Next slide. And this is um, what the output can produce. Um, once you have filtered down your data set, you've joined in your data, you can produce on the system, on the platform itself, a visualization of that data. So you can create um, different widgets in the form of a dashboard to, to show bar charts and show the most popular, or, uh, the most frequently occurring words and phrases. Um, and you can show the table of results um, and the ability to, to search those as well. So the point that I would like to get across is that the system is very flexible um, in that you can determine the, the words and the phrases that you're interested um, in, in understanding and learning about. Next slide, Carolina. And then I'll hand back over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that, um, Nathan. And, you know, we'll be happy to take questions on, on the back end of the platform in just one second. I did want to um, revisit this this point um, that I mentioned earlier that beyond the tracker, we're also, you know, working to create um, resources for um, the community to sort of better understand what's transpiring across um, uh, Internet standards development uh, organizations. Um, we recently run a call for papers on technical standards and internet fragmentation. Um, and here on the screen, you can see the seven projects that we have um, selected for, for funding. Uh, three of those are involved because those are actually uh, projects that are led by um, Raspar cheers, if that's a term, or we can make it a term. Um, so we have, you know, uh, Ignacio, uh, Nick, uh, and Steven who have presented here or or co-chairs of the space, um, actually um, uh, producing research um, as part of, you know, the Internet Centers Observatory Knowledge Center. So we'll be, you know, um, you know, or you can expect, you know, um, a papers on, for instance, geopolitics um, and standards, trends and participation um, and uh, participations and affiliations at, you know, spaces like ITF. Um, you know, what it means for Global South to participate um, in, um, in standards development, corporate influence uh, in different um, spaces and, and so forth. And we're also very um, excited, um, and I'll come to the next slide, to, um, oh, it's not working. Can you put on the next? That's the last one. Oh, that appears to be the last one, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, that is indeed the last one. Sorry about that. Um, so um, we're very excited um, to be working also with our colleague uh, Mark McFadden, um, who will be um, actually producing a series of um, blog articles for the Internet Standards Observatory. Here you have a few of the of the you know blogs that you know um, we'll be putting out shortly. Just again to sort of give you a, a you know a bit of flavor um, about you know what, what you know some of the blogs that we'll be um, uh, putting out. You know, um, Mark will be writing on internet centralization and the role of standards, um, what it means to standardize um, for technologies that don't yet exist, um, and the extent to which um, standards can contribute to uh, greening the internet. So, some these are some of the again the the, the topics um, that we'll be covering, and you know, hopefully this will be sort of resources for the community um, to better understand the, the standardization space. Um, so with that, if anyone has questions or comments, we'd be happy to take those now. Uh, thank you, Karina and Nathan. I think that Derek is first, and then Rich and Peter and Colin. Hi, Derek Kutscher, HKUST. Um, most interesting, thanks. Um, so on the, your first screenshot, you showed an example where you had the, the you know, directive uh, engage. I just wanted to understand what this means. Um, can, can you explain it? Yeah. Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so I think you know the the proposals. Um, we do the the color coding using the scoring system that my colleague Nathan sort of showed at the back end of the platform. And basically, the proposals that score highly in terms of um, you know having a you know a high number of um, you know keywords appear, um, you know, words that appear with high levels of frequencies are the one that's, you know, the ones that score higher in our system. We understand that proposals that cover, um, you know, certain topics that, you know, we've identified are, um, you know, um, aligned with, you know, introducing again new forms of doing naming or addressing online or new forms of doing routing and networking on the internet are, you know, proposals that we want the community to engage with. So basically our dictionaries cater to sort of you know, uh, bring those proposals to sort of the top of the pile, if that makes sense. So the color coding is really, you know, a way of us, you know, signaling to the community based on, you know, our dictionaries, which, um, you know, proposals we think, um, you know, require more, more attention and more participation from the community. Um, I will say um, as well, you know, we're, as, as my colleague Nathan sort of highlighted, I think um, the, the standards tracker is a very flexible tool. So we're also, you know, sort of open to working with other people that want to track different things um, online. For instance, um, you, you know, we're in the process of, um, uh, uh, you know, we submitted a, a proposal to the Open Technology Fund and we're sort of discussing with them what it would entail to um, incorporate uh, civil society as sort of a, you know, a target audience of the, the tracker and obviously developing uh, sort of dictionaries and, and uh, adjusting sort of iterations of, uh, of the tracker to things that you know are relevant for civil society to to track. Um, so I hope that answers the the question. Yeah, thanks. Just a little follow up. So I saw that most of your examples um, was were on contributions from 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 China. So do you see the risk that this could be, um, you know, influenced by certain bias and be used as a political tool eventually? So how do you make sure that you? Can, yeah, can so, <laughs> absolutely. No, that's another great point. Um, so we did this um, analysis of proponents in ITU study group 13 um, in their sort of July meeting of last year. Um, and roughly 95% um, of proponents are uh, Chinese or Korean. Um, so I think that bias has to do with just, the, you know, the fact that um, they happen to be very prolific in this um, specific study group that we were showing. Um, we are um, confident that when we expand the tracker to IETF, we're going to see a much more sort of varied um, set of proponents um, in the standards that sort of get picked up through our tracker. Um, and I think that will ease, you know, uh, that, that concern about sort of the, the political aspect. Right now, if you ask me, it's a reflection of who is actually presenting proposals at Study Group 13. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, next is Peter, and if we can keep questions and, ask, and answers succinct, that could be great. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Get yeah, sorry. I'll get better. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Peter Kordinik. Um, very, very interesting work and very promising, actually, this uh, standards tracker. I guess that um, this SDO is making your life a bit easier by having unencumbered access to the standards. <clears throat> now, with the other two that you mentioned, 
um, and maybe I missed that. What is the um, the method of access? Like uh, you chose a couple of um, study groups in ITUT, mm. um, and then it's flagged, but yeah. How would we be able, or who is the target audience for this? Who could access this and then verify and go into more depth? Yeah. There's one question to follow up maybe, um, since you chose the um, study groups in ITUT, we know that um, some of the music plays more in like council working groups. Um, would they also be, uh, would it be possible to, to add that to the tracker, but maybe respond to the first question first. Absolutely. Uh, so in the council groups, we, we don't track those, but we could. Um, um, at the, you know, at the moment, it's a question of sort of scoping the work. And we started with three groups um, to sort of go small, uh, but we can sort of grow from there. Um, and in terms of access to documents with ITUT, um, you, to be able to have access to full contributions, you either have to be a sector member or, um, or a member state, basically. We get access as sector members. We, um, the DNS Research Federation is a sector member of ITU. Um, and that's why we're um, you know, sort, sort of providing that high level information on the standards only. For our ITF, we'll be able to open our data sets, which is something that for the ITUT tracker, we are not able to do. Um, and you know, people will be able to access more in-depth information about the standards um, as well. I mean, just by the nature of ITF actually you know, being very transparent and opening the full drafts to the public. So I hope that answers the, the question. I... Yeah, maybe just one follow up. So yeah. did, I, did I understand correctly that the interface, the index is open to the public? The, the index of your of your uh, tracker system? Of the tracker, right. Yeah, well, the index is, you know, what you would see, um, yeah. you know, it's revealed, if you will, by um, our uh, filters actually in the, in the system. So that, that gives you a sense of, what, sense of what we are indexing for. Yes. Okay, thanks and applause. Thank you, of course. We have uh, three more questions okay. and four minutes, so... Okay, I'm not trying. Hi, uh, <laughs> Colin Perkins as an individual, and I will try to talk quickly. Um, it would be, so I think this is interesting work. Um, it would be interesting to understand um, how much of this tracker needs uh, a custom database and custom indexing underneath it, uh, and how much could be provided in, in the case of the IETF by just providing different uh, keyword searches and, and different views onto the data tracker, for example. To, to sort of broaden uh, um, the accessibility of the data tracker as, as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Nathan, I don't know if you want to take that one. If not, I'm happy to react. Yep, I can, I can jump in. Um, so, I mean, the, the system works very much in the case of the system needs to be fed information. Um, so any additional data sets that we can get to, to help augment the uh, the documents that are uploaded into the system will greatly um, improve the uh, search results. Um, so, yeah, I mean, any any additional data that, that, that would help, um, you know, people's interest, um, you know, would, would feed the system and, and only make it better. Hopefully that answers yeah, the question. Absolutely. And we're working, I'll just add Colin very quickly and we can continue a conversation um, offline as well that uh, we're using uh, the, you know, the data tracker as um, sort of a source for our ITF tracker. Um, and I'd be interested to, you know, maybe get your thoughts on how we could be more responsive to uh, what the community is interested in. I, well. I think it, if, if there are uh, ways of organizing ITF data tracker information that make it more accessible to different communities. I that see. might be an interesting thing to explore. Wonderful. Let's talk about that then. Hi, Mallory Nodal, Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, I came to the mic because I saw on the interface for the ITU stuff, which I can imagine being very useful for somebody like me who is part of a delegation for state, but I can't follow everything that's going on. So this could be really Helpful, but for the for the IETF, I wanted to point out the way you've categorized engagement by color um, means I think something slightly different to folks in the IETF. Like I would be concerned if like a draft that was in my research group said you know engage, but like it was further along in the publication process, then engagement would be helpful for. Right. So you know like you might. You just might consider not letting the numbers dictate what appears. And I, I would also say maybe it's something that can help you all or others triage engagement, but that ultimately, if you could get working group or research group chairs to say, I'd love it if you advertise this draft because the people that come to your tracker are people that I want to review this work mm -hmm. at the right time 
and with the right guidelines, that would actually be deeper engagement than I think just a sort of like computer says, read this right. might give you. So it's as you're designing that one, maybe treat the IETF a bit specially um, based on the other comments that people have made in, in this one as well. Yeah, that's all actually great feedback. Thank you, Mallory, for that. Um, lots of thoughts on it. Um, where to start? So um, one thing that I will say said- Where to start, but also where to finish. Where to finish, okay. Right so I'll, right. I'll just share maybe like one or two thoughts and then I'll continue a conversation with Mallory um, um, offline. But um, so we do not, the reason why we don't have the ITF tracker out yet is because we, we can use the same structure that we use for IT, ITU. So we're in the process of sort of thinking and, and sort of trialing different formats for the tracker so that it makes sense for the context of um, IETF. The question of the um, color coding, uh, it's a great point, actually. We put it out there as a way of make, being more transparent about how we prioritize the documents and also sort of with this purpose of helping the community prioritize things over others. Um, but, but yeah, you give me a lot of food for thought about how we approach the, the tracker for IETF now. I'll just follow up with Mallory uh, now in a second. Thank you very much, right, Carolina. Thank, thank you very much, Nathan. Sorry about that. We... No worries. <laughs> and the next presenter is uh, Sebastian uh, Benthal, who is going to be talking about uh, the new cool things that Big Bang can uh, can do. Sebastian, are you with us? Yes, I am. You hear me? Uh, we can hear you on your uh, call. Hear me? It's fine. Yes, we hear you well. Great. Uh, well, okay. Um, hi, I'm Sebastian Bentall. Uh, I'm a part of Big Bang. Or analyzing. So your connection is wait. not very good. Uh, oh no, that's it. Uh, let's try. Maybe if you kill the camera, that might help. Maybe. How about now? I'll just um, yeah, do my good. best. Okay, wonderful. All right, so um, this Big Bang is an open source software project for ingesting and analyzing and providing a data science environment for data from STOs. Um, we presented uh, quite a bit of a vision for Bang at IDEF 116, and I just wanted to give an update on progress since then. Um, we've had a new software release uh, named Goffman, uh, that's largely based on work that was done during the IETF 160 hackathon, and that includes um, new notebooks demonstrating functionality around name entity recognition, um, a notebook that uh, explores the question of gender and sentiment uh, based on mailing list participation. There's a lot of updates to the README, um, some other work on uh, some back end, uh, changing the libraries around. Um, and uh, replacing some of the sort of standalone scripts of the command line interface. Um, there's, uh, in terms of next steps or current work in Big Bang, um, Article 19 in NGO, uh, many of you are familiar with, is working with us, Big Bang, uh, to map the dominance of particular actors in uh, internet standards development organizations. So by actors, we, uh, we mean first order individuals participating, but really we're interested mainly in um, organizations participating as to use. And um, the link between organizations and individuals uh, is, is sometimes not explicit in the data, um, and sometimes it is. So there's an interesting task of filling in that data when it's absent, and uh, Article 19 has some people that can do hand coding of data, Whereas in other cases, we can um, fill in the kind of entity references. And we're interested in um, three domains of activity. We're interested in the leadership of uh, working groups, uh, sort of who uh, or uh, or whose people 
people are the chairs of working group. Uh, we're interested in the authors. Um, and I apologize for any sound issues. Uh, we're interested in the authors um, of RFCs uh, and standards, and we're also interested in who's being influential or at least active on the mailing lists. Uh, oh, I apologize. Um, quite likely is uh, on my side. Um, then the, uh, I could try um, just shifting the mic around um, sometimes. Is this better? Uh, better can you worse? try again? Is it better or worse? Is if you shout, I think it's better. If I shout, it's better. What if I turn up the volume? It's better. Well, it is. It is an improvement. I apologize. Um, yeah, it's definitely an issue on my side. Um, so, uh, okay. So for data, uh, what we're up to for sort of envisioning the next release, uh, improvements on the data ingest. There have been some changes in, um, uh, there's been some changes for how ITF uh, makes its email archives available and we're adapting to that. Uh, there's also a number of um, Jupyter notebooks and repository demonstrating uh, different kinds of analyses that are available um, and those need to be maintained and refactored because Python is always shifting, and Python is always shifting in terms of what's standard. And uh, we're also going to, in this round, uh, be ingesting from W3C. So, authorship and authorship data, especially in W3C. We already have some W3C mailing list ingest capabilities. And then um, we're going to be working hard on the, um, the analysis of these actor dominance in these three domains uh, leadership, authorship, and influence across those STOs. And then we're going to be uh, looking for the feasibility of extending this to other STOs like GPP and ITU. Um, and lastly, we're working on a grant proposal now uh, to develop this in some kind of dashboard form to make it more available, uh, playing largely on the roles of the actors in the working groups and then um, across Israel organizations and across working groups. Uh, and also some amount of the language crossing analysis based on sort of keywords, topic, maybe uh, uh, result, and it's a little bit. And that's, that's it. I'm going to keep it short, especially because of the sound issues. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, thank you for making the effort despite of the bad connection. Uh, are there questions from the room? Well, this sounds uh, quite interesting, and maybe it will be worth sharing some of these uh, bits uh, on the mail list because I reckon that the, the audio was uh, was a bit hard to parse. So I'm not sure all these interesting bits uh, uh, went through. Uh, so maybe you can share it in the mail list, and I'm sure that uh, there will be some people that are actually working on similar things and can give some feedback and insights. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, and our next presenter is Susan Her Hars. Hers, like Hers, sorry. And I think it stops running. So mine will be a little bit different as he's bringing up the slides. Um, many right. of you are looking at uh, mail lists and what's happening at the working group. I'm looking at what happens afterwards. And it's probably in a little different field. Um, it comes from the uh, genre of uh, social, in, uh, social uh, studies. Uh, so let me start in. Uh, the de topic is consensus decision-making. You know, in the ITF, we agree on standards by consensus. This was a three-phase mixed-mode study. I'll go into it, but the data is substantial. Uh, and this is public leadership. So here's the mission of the ISG. Hopefully all of you know that. 
does anybody need to go over it as far as that and the way drafts are created? I'm, if you need to, please let me know. The important thing is what are you all looking at versus RFC 2026, which describes the ITF process. You've looked at mail list research. I can't tell you how, as a personal working group chair uh, of, a chair, of a working group that's existed for 30 or 40 years, how excited I am about that, or to get feedback on reviewers' choices, or to see some of the standardization. There's just lots of benefits. But as you go through the process to handoff, you start with an individual draft, you go to working group adoption, you go through all the working group discussion you've talked about, you finally get it finished, and then you get to the ISG approval stage. This stage can take from, believe it or not, weeks to years. In case you, have, I've tracked some that are three to four years long. So you probably want to look at the back end of it and what causes that. In that, what I looked at is the process of ISG review, the resolution of comments, and the fixed handoff to the RFC editor. I also tracked back uh, a number of drafts in 2015 and 2016 to see how much delay. I do not present that there in time, but if you are interested, I can. Uh, I am dealing with history because sometimes it's politically unwise to be too close to modern history, uh, but I'm dealing with Chair 7, which is back down at Yari and before then. So what's the big news? The big news is the time that it takes to get through the ISG depends on many decisions they make. The more decisions they make on drafts that come out with the results, the better they are. There has been variances between 50% of their decisions result in some action actually occurring. A draft becoming an RFC, a working group forming, or perhaps administrative, like setting things for naming and addressing. The ISG has to do all of these, so your draft works on it. This is a graph of the differences between the ages. Notice at the bottom, you see that some ISGs range at 50%, some range at 100%. And so uh, the next question on results. By the way, you cannot get that result from the RFC publishing. There is no way to rec record how many decisions they make, how much, how many, what's their per uh, percentage of results. It's hidden in the ISG minutes. You have to dig it out. It does not reflect the RFCs. The RFCs go from January to January, and there's a delay, again, between, in the RFC publication, between one to two years, see your RFC uh, def, uh, statistics. This is one where I look at it by ITF chairs. If you can look at all the ITF chairs, and you can say what percentage of the decisions we're making. So your question then comes, if it varies, how can you predict it? That was the purpose of the study. The first thing I picked up in this study was to look at collaboration. We talk about collaboration. Is it the thing that if there's collaboration at the ITF that you'll predict it? No, I could not get a one-on-one -on -one given the classical definition of collaboration. I'll show that next. I went to solidarity, which says, a simple definition for solidarity for the layman is, where are you going to put your extra effort at? If when there's a problem, you dig in a little deeper and you make the thing succeed, that's solidarity. Sounds like perhaps the Polish uh, uh, a solidarity movement, but that's there's a classical definition in leadership on that that was researched by people in the Netherlands. And then I looked at how conflict actually works with it. Um, solidarity proved it, just in case you want me to tell you the end result, that that's uh, year on year a good predictor. Conflict is extremely complex in this environment because it's open. Because it's open and we value collaboration, conflict is there. Sometimes it's above ground, sometimes it's below ground. Here are the definitions. Okay, in order to enable myself to uh, answer questions, I'm going to let you read those definitions. Those are the ones that are approved. 
Uh, this I uh, presented uh, in the beginning of October at a leadership forum. So, and there are some other researchers and where it tags. So, this is a picture of the models with more details again. And here are, if you're uh, a social scientist, this is the definitions and the alternate theory and the data and the interviews. I'm glad to share it. Um, but what's probably most important for you all is this. What matters here is the amount of data. The amount of data that I dug through to find it and the very places it is in the data tracker are legendary. So I first went through a lot of historical data and collecting it is very difficult. And again, at future time, I'll do that. I also served the ISG in two different times. So I collaborated it. And then there's a matrix of triangulization. Probably the triangulization, your most frequent lift that comes at this level is cell phone triangulation. And I modeled some of it after it. Okay. And then or the reliability. If you're used to Cronbach's analysis, 90% um, is really good. And most of the stuff went to 85. Anything below 80 is not acceptable. So, and the self-reported effectiveness, one of the other key takeaways is there was a perfect model match when you did the RFC. So the, the ISG, when the surveyed, they really thought the RFCs represented it. At least it appeared that, I don't know. Didn't do interviews on that. Again, correlations, if you're interested on correlation reports in uh, multivariate statistics, HRM stocks for hierarchical regression models. Again, if I'm gonna go short on that and go to the key line. So I am super thrilled, super thrilled that all of you are working on all this data because really what matters is the quantity of quality data, okay? The fact that we get working group analysis that tags into this, the fact that we look at reviewers, all of this is mad important. Triangulation is absolutely critical. What I found out is when I looked at one stream by itself, I got one answer. When I looked at a second stream by itself, I got an answer. Now, bottom line, the solidarity uh, is better. Why am I so adamant to try to present? For the historical data, I did 10%. For 2015, 2016, I did 100% of the data. That's all the RFCs, all the minutes, all the detail. I looked at all the stuff that the ISG looked at, and I found a one-on-one -on -one match with my 10% and the two years that went deep dive. I mean, deep dive down to every little knit, uh, read every comment with every draft. But I would feel better with more data and I'm automating this because this was a preliminary guest study to go from 10% to 100% with automation tools that are based on a program you may not know about, which is MaxQDA and some other leadership specific tools. I hope uh, I picked those tools because hopefully you can export the data. Questions? How did I do? Pretty good for time? Excellent. Okay. I, I, he was coaching me that I should be right on time and allow questions. Any questions or was this just like not in your will well, uh, meaning not in something you're focused on? Yes, yes Colin. From Colin. Hello. I pressed the button in the app, but I can't make the app work. Hey, uh, Colin Perkins. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, this, this is interesting work. Uh, it's uh, there's clearly been uh, you know, you've clearly done a tremendous amount of analysis, especially looking at the historical data, uh, which is pretty hard to get hold of. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I do appreciate the amount of effort that's got into this and, and some really interesting results. Um, the amount of data that's being recorded in the data tracker about the ISG decisions. I'm going to step up because I'm having trouble with this mic hearing. It. Sure. So I, I can move if to the front step mic if it's closer. I'll be able to hear. Is better. that better? There. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, the amount of data that's being recorded in the data tracker has uh, about the ISG decisions and the process has uh, steadily increased over time. Yes. Um, Clearly, the historical data is not in the data tracker, and you have to trawl through the minutes and, and who knows what. Um, going forward, is, is the 
is the data you need to do this sort of analysis now being recorded, or or rather still gaps in what's being recorded okay. in the data tracker? Best question yet I've had on this. Thank you. Um, the answer is for drafts, yes, much, much better because the ballot's in there. For working groups, when they came in, which is notice I did the full study after I got the working groups in, what's not there that I had to develop for myself was the fact management island cycle. So let me give an example, something you all know about IPR. Yari kept having 2015, 2016, a repetitive management item that was IPR and I went through the data once and I didn't catch the fact he was just repeating. That was bad. I had to go back through all the data, reevaluate it and create a stream of management items because they're not tracked. They're not, I could, for each of those results, I verified it against a result in the RFC or a result in a ballot or something. For the management, I, I recorded all of that in the dissertation because it isn't any place. They just sort of throw it out there, yet they spend a third of their time in a meeting on that. It would be good if we had something like that for the ISG to say, okay, this is their management items, this is what they do. Excellent question. Yeah, it's, it's one of the thing. It's one of the things which is is starting to be recorded. But see, it, what, it seems to be one of the less structured bits, certainly. So yeah, I can I can see how that's difficult. Thank you. And there are numbers on all of this. Please, there's there's lots of pages. Anyone else? We have Nick Dotti in the queue. Yeah, thank thank you for this presentation and for for all the hard work. Um, I I was particularly curious by that sort of last comment you made about um, Max. QDA and um, having some of the qualitative data potentially exportable. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I guess I'm just curious, like that, that is like it, it itself a standards problem that I think most of these qualitative tools don't work very well together. Um, but what sort of um, qualitative tagging are you doing or, or what would be useful to have like multiple tools work with? Okay, let me go back. That's, an, again, a very, very good question. I need to go back to a step here. The data analysis uses a technique called IPA analysis, which is essentially a, let me translate it. it it's, an, it's called uh, interpretive phenomenological analysis, which is essentially a string analysis where there's a human being behind it that says this is important. It's done in environments we don't know what the answer is and you're trying to build this stuff. So this Max QDA is a tool that leadership analysis people use to be able to track a set of things and then tag it. And then it has a lot of statistical backend that's built in. Um, the fact that they're trying, you can run um, JSON scripts on it, you can do various things, but it is, uh, I picked it because it's an accepted tool in the leadership genre, in the social science genre, people who look at uh, 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 inclusivity uh, studies use something like that. So it's an accepted one. I was hoping, and it, it's getting better to out export my coding of this. Now, how did I code? I took this, that's, that's the key question. I sent a survey to the ISG, okay? And I use the very questions on the survey to encode it. So if it asked, um, uh, are you willing to go the extra mile to help? And that's not, not the phrase, but I'm, I'm restating it. Are you willing to, to help your fellow ID if they get in trouble? And if the answer was yes, I look for actual things inside their minutes that said that. So I could, it's called uh, histometric analysis. It's a technique in the leadership environment that, that is used to go back and look at past leaders, uh, Hitler or, or Roman leaders or something to say, how do we look at history? How do, we, how do we do that? It's a particular methodology that's approved. But one way that you can mix survey in that uh, is you use the same questions. And I, I hope I didn't bore the rest of you. It's, it's really detailed work on how you do uh, uh, research with his metric documents. This group, uh, the, the leadership area has, 
has a large group of uh, body work at that. And we have another Thank question from uh, Andrew Campling. Hi, thank you. Uh, Andrew Campling, 419 Consulting. Um, just a really simple question, because this is way outside my sort of knowledge area. Based on what you've looked at with the ISG, is there any one thing that stands out that you think should be done differently so okay. it's more, more effective? This is going to sound really funny. Give them time to socialize. I know that's a really, because solidarity is built on trust. Trust is built on getting to know one another. If you're always hammering on one another to get a draft out. So I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase Russ uh, Monday, and I don't think he'd mind at this point. He used to say, we really see an uptick in the benefit of the ISG when we go away and we have a retreat. Please don't cut that funding. You don't know that it actually translates to getting out because solidarity is based on them getting to know another, however they do it. You know, some people may do it one way or another, but the ITF chair has got to really work on that because when the ITF chair goes away and Yari was pulled away to do IANA transition in 2015, 2016, you can see the decrease. You can also see the uptick of, con con uh, of conflict. Please don't cut. It sounds funny, but please don't cut their, their social time. Fund it because you'll get more documents and more working groups and the rest at the end. Is that a simple answer? And taking the privilege of being the chair, maybe a quick question from my side. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the cool presentation. I was wondering how difficult it is to identify solidarity and whether that changes over time. And I'm thinking people that uh, might be uh, so solidarity in a tacit way, and maybe it's difficult to reflect that in minutes. So how uh, did you... Uh, so again, there are questions and you look at the, t you look at, first of all, when you give them the survey, they're going to answer it. When you look at the question, you look at the text and you say, does the text represent it? I have a 200 page portion of the dissertation, which goes over how I matched that to text and when I did it. So yes, it's not easy, but what we did, and again, uh, Saldana states that this is an effective coding to match surveys with this. So I followed, his, and again, it's a social science technique that I followed based on classical documentation. Read the text and see with an IPA analysis, does it match this? For example, uh, one of the things we tested as a control variable was task interaction. That's easy. Are you seeing balance? Did you know that only a, uh, on an average, only 11 out of the 15 people valid? That was in the slides, but why? Too busy, checked out, sometimes making a decision. Okay, that's a real interesting statistic that's one-on-one. -on -one. Some years are better, some years are less. But in 2015, 2016, where I looked at everything, that's a scary moment. Why are we doing that? Are some people overloaded? Those are, again, that's a simple example. For solidarity, are they doing a positive comment on the document? If you get a document and someone says, I hate it, I'm not going to do anything with it, well, that's not very helpful. If this person says, I'm going to do this and here are five suggestions and why don't we talk offline, I'm sure we can come to an agreement. There you go with solidarity. Is, is that helpful? Okay, I know this is out of the wheelie, out of your bandwidth. This is also out of uh, the leadership scope. They've never seen someone sit in the middle, but what we know about complex theory is the best changes occur in the middle between genres. And I have a, a long history in the ITF. Anyway, hope this is helpful. You can tell I'm really pepped and I've done a lot of work. Thank you very much. And we started in with uh, two presentations about uh, collecting data from standardizations, and uh, then Susan talked about uh, analysis of that data. And uh, Matthew Russell Barnes uh, is going to continue with that uh, strand on analyzing patterns in the idea.
Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Matthew Russell Barnes. I'm from Queen Mary University. I work with Ignatio, Stephen, and Colin, who have talked. Uh, I'm looking at the communication patterns in the ITF. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, in the ITF over time. Um, the way I do this is there's we built a social graph of the mailing list interactions. This is just um, some brief statistics. I can come here. Brief statistics of the mailing list uh, social graph. There are about 10,000 nodes in this graph. There are about 550,000 edges in the graph. And this this plot just shows um, how many active nodes uh, there were in the last year um, uh, over time. And we can see that the, the mailing list has become less active over time, which is an interesting thing to say. So, no, nodes means uh, participants. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'll go into that. So no, no it's in, the, in a graph is participants, edges are communication between those participants. Uh, and it says the, the second bullet point is just we've collated email addresses together to create person IDs. So if there's if someone uses multiple uh, email addresses, they're collated into one person. Um, so the ITF also has uh, a hierarchical structure. There's uh, the three layers. There's the regular participants, which I wish I call them that. Uh, which are me and regular people that I go to working groups. There's then the working group chairs, which chair the working groups, like Nathio here. Uh, and then there's uh, all these working groups are collated into areas. You probably all know this, but I'm just going to go over it. Uh, and then, <laughs> uh, then the, there's area directors who direct those areas. So there's these three layers that I want to look at how this hierarchical structure affects the communication patterns in the ITF. So that is my key question that I'm putting at the top of the slide. How does hierarchy affect communication patterns? And the key concepts that I need to address before I go into the methodology of how I do this are, first of all, the degree of a node, degree of a person, is how active that individual is in the, in the mailing list. So the number of connections that person has in a particular year or something is their degree. Then there's the average neighbor degree, which is um, <clears throat> the degree of a person's neighbor. So a neighbor is someone that someone has talked to. Uh, someone has a connection with, and then you average those degrees, and that's the average neighbor degree. And then the time window <clears throat> is a collation of all the activity within a certain time window, a uh, certain time frame. So maybe a year, a month, or something like that. I'm using a year in this presentation. So that's just uh, some key concepts. I use uh, degree and average neighbor degree and correlate them together through diff two different time windows to uh, calculate some interesting correlations. The first correlation I'm interested in, we call, I call philanthropy, which is the correlating the individual degree of a person, so the number of connections that a person has, with uh, that person's neighborhood's average degree in the future. Uh, a positive correlation of this would be an active person, so if someone has lots of connections, um, their neighborhood gain, has lots of connections in the future, so they kind of help the neighborhood communicate in, in the ITF. Or the kind of opposite of that is an inactive person this way to discussion of their neighbors. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a positive correlation. Next correlation would be uh, an, an active person kind of stifles their neighborhood. So their neighbors don't want to talk if you're active, uh, if that person is active. And an inactive uh, individual, the neighborhood thrives. So uh, people like to talk when that person doesn't talk kind of thing. <clears throat> Uh, another correlation is kind of the opposite of that, is looking at how the neighbors affect the individual. So uh, if you have a high average neighbor degree in time window one, uh, then <clears throat> your degree in the future will be high, I guess. Um, so the way you think about this is if, you have, if you're in an active neighborhood, then you want to talk more. Or if you're in an active neighborhood, then you don't want to talk more. That's the positive correlation. And then obviously negative is the opposite of that. <clears throat> and now, Let's look at some plots. Uh, so this plot is, both of these plots are, top one is philanthropy, the bottom one is community. And we're looking at blue is the regular participant uh, line, and orange is the working group chair line. <clears throat> and we see that there is an increased effect for both philanthropy and community for working group chairs. That suggests that if people talk to the working group chair, uh, if, yeah, if, if the neighbors of working group chair, so like the working group talks to a, the working group chair, that's community. Um, then they will talk more. And if the working group chair talks a lot, then the neighbors uh, will talk more. So there's like kind of a facilitation of discussion in, within a working group. That's what we see. So there's um, more of an effect of philanthropy and community for working group chairs, especially for community. Uh, 
So that's the first thing we saw working group chairs. Are they good facilitators? We think so. There's, they're affected uh, positively by a neighbor's activity and the neighbors affect them positively, but we don't look at the communication direction in that particular instance. So now we want to have a look at who people are talking to. We do this by looking at what's called motifs. Uh, I'm looking at temporal three edge motifs, which at most use three nodes. In this case, I'm just looking at three motifs that use three nodes. So on the left, we have the outward star motif, where one node, the blue node, talks to two other nodes with three outward edges. So they talk to people. Well, I've given some sort of um, ways to understand this uh, at the bottom. It's kind of announcements or disseminate, dissemination of information, so they kind of talk out to people. There's inward stars, <clears throat> where two nodes talk to one person, and that would be kind of maybe questions to that one person or condensing of information. So people talk to someone. And then there's mixed stars, which is a kind of combination of inward and outward. And that's more of like discussion or facilitation, as we looked at before in the previous slides. And there's some plots of these. Um, <clears throat> At the top is the outward star, that's the um, discussion uh, announcements. Um, we see that all three levels of the hierarchy, the blue is regular participants, the orange is working group chairs, and the greens are area directors, all three of them have a kind of similar level of outward star, so outward uh, like announcements or talking to other people outwardly. But the two bottom plots, there's a, a higher um, proportion of uh, inward stars and mixed stars for the higher levels of the hierarchy. Uh, so both working group chairs and area directors get more inward communication and they, they have more kind of facilitation or dis uh, discussion with other people. So this would suggest that the regular participants like to talk to the higher levels of the hierarchy and they, um, I don't know, they facilitate discussion and <clears throat> that's what we see in the plots. So we can see that people talk upwards and they like to have a discussion. So that's kind of my whole conclusion is the working group chairs do facilitate discussion in the working groups, which is what you want out of the working group chairs. Uh, the regular participants send out more than they receive in, so they kind of talk to people more than people talk to them. And the area directors of working group chairs seem to be condensers of discussion. So they get talked to more and then they talk out less. So they kind of condense information and then announce it to people. That's kind of the end of my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, yes, we have uh, one question from Brian and a question from Carolina. Okay. Hi, I'm sorry, I forgot to look at the slide number. Could you go back to I think it's seven. Uh, the slide number is even the AR. Uh, the, yeah, okay. Uh, there it is. Yeah, there's a seven down there. Yeah. What happened in 2016? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we think in 2016 there was a shift in the areas. Has that, uh, I think Colin said that to uh, me. There was like a, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah All right, so, we, okay. Um, People. Oh, it so it just it took a little while for there was a there was a top down organizational change that took yeah, a while. Yeah, so for the rep... working group chairs would have talked more than normal, I guess. Okay. Yeah, like more kind of telling people what's happening and stuff like that. That's what we think. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, I mean, like I, I just noticed that that almost correlates exactly with like Brexit. And it was like, oh, I mean, it was a bad year for some <laughs> people, but okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> While Carolina joins, just a disclosure, Brexit did not affect this research. <laughs> That's funny. Um, hi, this is Carolina. Hi. So I think this is brilliant research. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, looking at it, I was thinking it would be useful for other um, uh, internet organizations um, that engage with the community to do similar research. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about um, how you treated regular participants. So you were looking at hierarchy, you looked at area directors, working group chairs, and then everyone else was a regular participant. And what I see is that, um, you know, I, I describe some people in the community as the usual suspects, meaning like people that are, are very comfortable with sort of, you know, staying in their position and, you know, they tend to sometimes dominate conversations in, you know, groups and spaces. And I'm thinking of even places beyond IETF, uh, mm -hmm. other internet organizations. Um, so I was wondering whether you were measuring for that um, or whether you intend to measure for that in the future. Uh, no, I didn't really measure for that. The way I, I uh, uh, categorize people is if you are never, ever working group chair or air director in my data set, then you are a regular participant. But if you are a working group chair or air director, then you're not in that regular participant bucket. You are in 
the working group chair bucket when you are that person, just to make it very distinct between the three groups. And, and could you like see of the, the regular participants who are frequent contributors, for instance, would that be a way of maybe measuring it? I'm just, you know, curious, you know, as to whether that can be measured and, you know, what sort of inferences you can make also um, to make cer certain spaces and conversations more diverse when there's people that monopolize those spaces and conversations. Um, and I may be thinking of a you know, yeah, yeah, that's somewhat a, that's specific example. Not so, I, I wouldn't say that specific, but, but no, yeah. That's interesting. And we, we looked at it more of uh, aggregated um, communication more than individuals. But yeah, we could. that's an interesting way we could take it. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, the queue is Jay, please. Thanks, um, Jay Daly. So uh, thank you, that was very interesting. Um, two questions. Um, one, um, have you considered, when you're looking at the philanthropy, uh, philanthropy side of things, of when somebody can effectively suppress communication by the, the level of posting, right. um, have you correlated that to the length of the message they send at all? to see whether somebody who sends an extremely long message most regularly does that compared to anybody else. That would be very interesting. <laughs> um, the second thing is, when somebody sends a message like that, it could do one of two things. It could be everybody goes, oh, yeah, great, marvellous. That's resolved. We don't need to think about this. Or everybody else could please go, please, no, dear God, I need to go somewhere else now. Um, have you got any way of um, being able to distinguish between two of those, or could you consider that? Uh, I think we could probably distinguish that. I, we didn't look into, in this particular study, we didn't look into the, co the content of the messages. It was just whether you talk to people. But we we can look into the content. That could be an interesting way to take it, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's definitely possible. There are a number of things that you could do, like uh, look at the sentiment, look yes. at the length, uh, look at the number of questions, for example. Yeah. Uh, look at the number of topics that uh, a particular message covers. So you have different ways of approximating the quantity of information uh, inside of a message, Correct. other Thanks. than a part of the length. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Christina is next. So many questions. Hi, Christina. Um, if you can go back, go back to the first slide. The first where, one, yeah. Where, um, yeah, um, where you're proving that the communication or mailing list decreased. I would laugh if we can look into where else people are communicating because you can't produce the same number of RFCs with like this yeah, yeah. last amount of mailing this discussion. And I kind of have a personal hypothesis that it's GitHub and I have a personal interest to kind of <laughs> encourage, like, encourage ITF to, you know, put more attention towards GitHub discussions. Because from my personal experience, a lot of decisions being made on GitHub, but officially it's still the mailings decision, it's a final decision, and that kind of leads to a lot of discrepancies, people not following what updates have been made to the drafts. So I was curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah, we're actually looking into the GitHub stuff now. That's kind of our next step. So yeah, your intuition. Yeah, you're looking right. forward. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, th I think that uh, there are a few groups uh, that are very active in Git, but many are not. So probably for those groups, the analysis would be very biased, but I guess that for the others, probably not. We did look at some point at the numbers uh, for Git, use, uh, Git usage in ITF versus W3C, and the uptake of Git in the ITF is much smaller in comparison, though it might have changed a bit in the last few years. Uh, Colin. Hi, uh, Col Colin Perkins. Yeah, I mean, on, on that previous point, I, I think it's true that the use of Git, Git and GitHub is certainly increasing in the ITF, so it'd be interesting to look at that. Um, th this is obviously based on public data, of course. It's based on the, an analyzing the public mailing list archive. Um, I, I suspect it's not possible. It would be really interesting to see how um, adding in things like the IESG mailing list and private conversations uh, affected it. <laughs> of course, sure, that yeah. data is not available, but uh, it would be fascinating. Mm. I agree. Uh, we might submit a request for the IESG for snooping on the participants. <laughs> uh, Marek. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, in relation to the patterns for working group chair and area directors, did you distinguish between kind of within their area of, of kind of leadership as opposed to kind of cross area communication with any of these patterns? Uh, or, no, we didn't. It was just across the whole ITF. But that is something, again, that we want to look into in the future. Yeah. yeah. Oh. 
Because I feel like you could look at like pretty simply at the like the list for the working groups and, and kind of draw yeah, it be interesting to but... see if you're more active in your own working group. Or... Yeah, or different yeah. facts. Yeah. That yeah, yeah. Thanks. And we had closed the queue, but Alexander had a question. If Alexander can make that question very fast, uh, and Matthew can also answer it fast. I just have a piece of food for thought. I agree with this transition to GitHub. This is where my working group does most of the work. And the issue is in the long distance um, of our development, it's a proprietary platform, which one day may just be taken offline. Whereas the mailing lists are available, you can crawl them, analyze them. If we transition towards GitHub, which is you know user-friendly and quite convenient, we actually lose something potentially. And maybe we should think collectively about the tools we use because it can potentially close doors that are currently open. End of transmission. That's Thanks. a really point. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you. And if Nick uh, can come to the States. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. And uh, thank you all for being here. My jet lag is just hitting, so buckle up because I may lose my train of thought. My name is Nick Merrill. I'm from the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And this talk is called CDNs and States. So, uh, you know, look, uh, this is not going to be news to this crowd, but as a percentage of internet traffic, mostly the tier one ISPs are not so relevant anymore. Mostly, most people doing normie stuff online don't really leave their ISP. They don't really leave their home AS. The request goes to the ISP and then it goes to a, an off net or an edge cache. We call it cache or cache, an edge cache that, um, you know, is, is at that ISP. And you know, if you look at the numbers from Sandvine and you know what Akamai said publicly, and you add them up, just back of the envelope, more than 50% of all traffic on the internet is served by these offnets. So most internet traffic comes from these offnets. To abuse a, a Wu Tang Clan quote, you know, cash rules everything around me. And though the death of the tier one network is overhyped, you know, yeah, it's much less relevant than it used to be. Although I found out recently, most policymakers don't know that yet. Uh, and I wrote a law review piece with my collaborator at Berkeley Law, Tejas Narachania, um, where we kind of dispelled this notion of the, the competitive internet core, you know, that the internet core doesn't really look the way that people think it does anymore. Really, it's these content distribution networks or CDNs that deliver the internet as most people experience it. Now the question becomes, how do states think about CDNs? There's curiously little research on this. And that doesn't mean that nobody knows it, okay? I'm sure that there are plenty of people in the State Department who have plenty of thoughts about this, but none of them have talked to me, okay? And there are probably plenty of people in Google's policy team that have thought of this, but same problem, okay? So when you do a literature search on this, there isn't really that much information about how states think about CDNs or vice versa. And, you know, just as a way of background here, there's this great piece by Frederick Duzay that totally changed the way I think about the internet. She wrote it in 2014. And she claimed basically the internet is both the cause and effect of geopolitics. So it won't be a surprise to anyone in this room that the internet is the effect of geopolitics. Okay, you rule a country and you're a dictator. Uh, people are saying stuff you don't like because you have some political goal. You're going to censor that information. You're going to censor that uh, uh, kind of traffic online. Um, and that is, of course, the effect of geopolitics, right? But if you accept this, then it's a short leap to uh, go on and say, well, of course, it is also the cause of geopolitics. Now, imagine all of those people for whom the internet is censored. They don't know about certain things that are online, so they maybe they behave differently, or they simply become more docile. There you go. The internet structure has gone on and affected geopolitics. So this two-way relationship plays out in a variety of different domains that are of historical interest to ITF, IRTF. You know, China with routing, China has this great bottleneck. A lot is made about the Great Firewall, but there's also this great bottleneck. Only three IXPs connect uh, the domestic mainland Chinese internet to the rest of the world's internet. And that makes foreign websites ever so slightly slower than domestic websites, which exacerbates a preference for, for domestic websites. Similarly, Iran has this uh, selective kind of international censorship regime, relies on a mix of BGP and, and DNS, and is quite sophisticated. You can follow up, of course, all of these are linked through uh, in the slides. And similarly, you know, there's this great uh, paper that came out in 2021 about Eastern Ukraine's 
a routing dependency on Russia. And then the authors at that time, Lemonnier and colleagues said, you know, hey, this is going to be a problem. If there's ever military action in Eastern Ukraine. It's going to make it a lot easier to deny uh, internet access in that region. That came out in 2021. The rest is history, right? So we know a lot about this two-way relationship. And by the way, I, I put these studies up there because they're great studies. And also it illustrates that this two-way relationship cause and effect, this is not philosophy, okay? This helps us think about practical issues that, that you know, are, are kind of of everyday uh, uh, political importance. So we, we think about, you know, BGP, we think about DNS, but how does CDNs fit into this geopolitical picture? This is not super well understood. So narrowing this question somewhat, you know, there are two kind of questions on my mind that I think help frame this. How do states want the internet to be and why do they want it to be that way? And how do CDNs want the internet to be and why do they want it to be that way? Now, you're, again, you're probably immediately asking which states? All of the states? And which CDNs? So every CDN? Are we counting the commercial CDNs like Akamai and, you know, the so-called hypergiants that are vertically integrated, basically, you know, content houses uh, plus content delivery systems with offnets? Okay, these are all good questions. We'll get to them in a second. What I'm illustrating here is more a way of framing the question I'm trying to ask here. So how do states want the internet to be? We actually know a good amount about that already. There's a great, uh, a lot of really great work about uh, uh, kind of internet sovereignty and, and how states, you know, policymakers think about the internet as, as a realm for sovereignty. We know a lot less about two, and we know almost nothing about the relationship between one, one or two. So now you're probably asking, okay, why care about this? You, you've established to me that, that uh, CDNs are, are, you know, kind of important to the internet and we don't know about it, but, but why really care about this? So this is uh, what everything that happens when a user visits a web page. Okay, don't read this. The point is that it's too complicated to understand, okay? But this, is, uh, uh, this was included in this great paper by David Clark in 2012, Control Point Analysis. And, you know, Clark's point in this uh, paper was that although this is very complicated, there are a few key control points uh, that, that kind of govern the way that the internet works, uh, maybe for everybody. So some prior work I did uh, with the Internet Society uh, for their Pulse dashboard, I was looking at kind of jurisdiction of some of these key control points. This came up in Mark McFadden's uh, uh, talk earlier today. Uh, you know, the, uh, there are a lot of different control points. They're run by a handful of companies, maybe a small handful, maybe a large handful, depends on your perspective. But whatever the handful is, there is exactly one jurisdiction uh, that, that uh, is behind most of the corporations here, and it's the United States. So one thing I conclude from looking at this chart, you know, in proxy services, by the way, that includes CDNs. So proxy services, CDNs, interchangeable for our purposes. Um, these and CDNs, uh, they may not work exactly the way that the U.S. federal government wants them to work, but the U.S. federal government consents to the way that they work, okay? There's no huge problem here that is a deal breaker and is making the U.S. federal government come to CDNs and say, hey, cut this out. You're going to have to do something totally different from what you're doing. The U.S. government is consenting to the way that the, the uh, CDNs are delivering the internet. At least that's, that's my conclusion. But uh, that might not be true for all states. So who in this room, as a brief show of hands, knows about Stuxnet or remembers Stuxnet? An overwhelming majority. Okay, I'll just go very briefly. Basically, this was a, uh, you know, the actor who perpetrated this was unknown. Okay, wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, there was this uh, very sophisticated, multi-step uh, uh, kind of offensive operation against the Iranian, the Iranian nuclear program at the time. And uh, it required a, the whole lot of, of really neat kind of offensive capability. But the point is, you know, the point I take away from it, if you're a state, you have a really sophisticated offensive cyber capability, you can take down something even that's pretty well protected, it air gapped and all the other things. So the question on my mind here is, is it ever possible that a state would be motivated to do a Stuxnet level attack on a CDN? And you may immediately think, a state would never do that. If you took down or disrupted a CDN, the state would suffer too much because we all rely on these CDNs. Well, I'm here to tell you that is not so much the case. There are several states whose internet sovereignty programs are sophisticated enough that they don't actually require, uh, they don't actually rely on CDNs as much as the rest of the internet does. Um, and, you know, make of that what you will, but what I make of it certainly is that the cost for disrupting CDNs, if, if you are in a country that has this kind of sovereignty uh, uh, regime, is uh, much lower for you than it would be for anyone else. And so, you know, CDNs, they serve a lot of content. Not everyone likes the content that they serve. And on top of that, we all rely on them a, a, a lot. So if your goal is to deny internet access, then disrupting a CDN is, is not a bad way to go about it. And uh, we all have seen, I think, in recent, um, recent 
two years and, and this year that uh, denying internet access is an incredibly um, indispensable part of the arsenal during, uh, um, you know, combat and, and military operations. So, you know, I think that uh, we should always be concerned about uh, new ways to deny internet service. So what states, I was, you know, said, how do states think about it? Which states? I think we're probably most concerned with states that maybe don't consent to the ways that CDNs work, especially uh, states that have lower reliance on CDNs and may have. Yes, okay, I'll wrap up right now. Okay, so then uh, uh, my question is basically how do we think about this? And this is what I come uh, to this working group to ask. How can we help understand particularly how CDNs want the internet to be? How do CDNs want the internet to be? If we understood a little bit more about how CDNs wanted the internet to be, we'd be able to put that up against the best available information about how states want the internet to be and say, okay, where are there tensions here? Where, are there, uh, uh, where is there room for collaboration? And, and where might the tensions arise? Where might there be danger in those tensions? These are a few papers that I know about. There are a couple other uncertainties, but to wrap up in the interest of time, I will stop here and, and uh, move over to the, to the queue, which I see is, is growing. Brian. Great question. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I have what might sound like a nitpick, but might actually have some insight behind it. Can you go back to the, the slide with the proportions of, yeah, the big the bar graph? Yes. So there's a really interesting thing here. I'm assuming that this is post Let's Encrypt. Yes, this is post Let's yeah. Encrypt. Yeah, so like 90 something percent of that 96% is Let's Encrypt, yeah, which happens, yeah, encrypt. right? Yeah, yeah. So one of these bars is like, built on open infrastructure and basically anybody who can figure out, you know, where to find a data center, which of course, yes, is like 60% over on the, on this slide as well, could like basically replace it as a choke point, right? It's an easily replaceable choke point in a way that data centers are a much more difficult to replace choke point, right? Like there's real estate involved and construction contracts, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it would be interesting as you go down this, this, like this path of like, and analyzing the replaceability of the stuff under the depth tree of a data center, how much of it is facilitated by having an open protocol that actually, you know, makes it, you know, go find a cloud provider and stand it up and you're done in, in 48 hours versus go find a bunch of backhoes and some land somewhere that nobody's using. Yeah, great point. Thank you. Mallory Nodal, Center for Democracy and Technology. So really liked the talk. Thank you very much, Nick. I, I wanted to introduce a case that I don't think was present in your problem statement, which is there are some places where it's neither the state nor CDNs that create this problem of like islands. So uh, an example I can think of is Armenia, which is surrounded by Iran, Turkey, Azerbaijan, and you know has essentially only a teeny tiny percentage of its connection going out through Georgia and is otherwise a completely free and democratic state that does not put any filters or censorship on its network. Nonetheless, it is under a heavy, heavily censored internet because of its neighbors. And so that's a case of the state would love its internet to be more open, um, but the CDNs are not serving that purpose and there's no way to sort of, well, well, I think unless we reframe it, as maybe you're suggesting, there's no way to sort of break out of like, how do we help places like Armenia. Another one we heard about this morning is like, um, you know, the, the territory um, A and B um, in um, Palestine, like no choice, right? But to, to just take the internet that one is served irrespective of like what the state wants. So anyway, just something to add to this a little bit. Where yeah, I'm great, about. great point. Thank you. Yeah, there's, yeah, the, again, the, you know, the, this point that brings up, this is so complicated and CDNs sit on top of, of course, you know, the, this very complex infrastructure we heard about earlier in Palestine, you know, there's denial of all kinds of different internet services. One of them is the electromagnetic spectrum, the EM spectrum, the radio spectrum. And that kind of denial is like this legal policy denial. And it's like, oh God, you know, once you have that kind of, oh God, it's, you know, it's hard to even think about what, um, to do on top of that. So thank you for that question. Dirk? Um, Dirk Kutscher, HKU Stewie. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, so there are, I think, two ways of looking at CDN. So one is uh, like a, a critical infrastructure, centralized um, points. The other thing is, I mean, CDNs also um, are kind of shield, shields of uh, for like DDoS attacks and, and those things. So um, it's kind of difficult to say, right? We, um, we, how to imagine that um, 
abolishing CDN would make the internet uh, automatically more robust. I'm not talking about no, abolishing no, 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 CDNs. Right, right, right. Like I've never said, I think CDNs are great. I right. think we all rely on them. They literally run the internet. My only question is how do they conflict with the interests of states? Because if they do conflict with the interests of states, it is possible the state might have an incentive to attack the CDN and that would be horrible for everyone. Mm, right. Um, <clears throat> then the other comment, um, so you mentioned um, censorship and uh, it's of course um, a problem. But um, also in connection with CDN, um, so um, censorship happens on, on multiple layers, right? So not only on the connectivity layer, but um, say maybe even more in impactfully um, on the say information or application layer. So for example, social networks, uh, microbolic blocking platforms uh, and so on. Um, so this affects CDN directly because um, states may want to enforce um, certain censorship there. And um, so I'm not sure whether that's something to, to look into. That yeah, well. great. Thank you for the comment. Andrew. Hi, uh, Andrew Kapling, 419 Consulting. Um, two thoughts. One is on the chart you, you put up with the different sort of bars. Well, yeah, that one, thank you for my very loose description of it. Um, I, I guess an observation, of course, of some of the CDNs at least operate across multiple bars so actually you could argue Total. the scope of activity of the cdn is much broader than that is not so tightly defined um, which probably makes the, the, the issue worse in terms of the whole centralization thing um, on your question about what they want the internet to be certainly by observation of some of them it's very homogenous um, uh, which makes them extremely vulnerable to attack because if you crack how their architecture is you know their toast but basically every node everywhere in the world is exactly the same um so there's absolutely no diversity um, i doubt you even need to crack them all if you crack one you know so many developer tools are hosted on that one that it you know crashes all that even if you go you take akam akamai down all of the packages that that cloudflare uses to build their endpoint tools are probably hosted on akamai that kind of thing. yeah um, and then final comment if you look at the sort of policies in the very loosest sense of the word, of some of the CDNs in their approach to things like the content that they tolerate, and compare and contrast that with the public policy of some of the states. You might have a larger set of nation states that would be potential attackers because they've got hugely divergent interests without drawing any value judgments as to who's right. Um, that's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Excellent points. And I appreciate your comment also about how, yeah, you know, like Cloudflare also manages your DNS and your point of presence, all that stuff. It's a great point. Just a quick comment uh, before Ramakrishna jumps in, taking, abusing my privilege as a chair. <laughs> uh, this plot is very interesting, but given the fact that uh, most of the users of the internet uh, belong to the West and in particular to the US, it is probably biased to the fact that it represents uh, that demand. If you were to look at it in different countries, you might have a different picture in one direction or the other. Totally agree. Yeah. So that's a really good point. So a lot of this data comes, by the way, this is just background. I'm sorry, Rob, for, for delaying your question. A lot of this data comes from the Crux top website data set, which is skewed for a number of reasons. That is one of them. And also, you know, a lot of, well, whatever, we can get into this some other time. I'm going to yield to Ram for now. Yeah. Ram. Hi, uh, Ram from University of Michigan. Great talk. Um, I also had a question about this graph, which oh, God, I shouldn't um, put this graph up. I'm not getting any feedback on the actual methods I might use. So this is good. Keep going. Uh, no, I mean, you, um, I'm, I'm wondering what your definition of a US based company is, because I imagine many of these CDNs are, you know, registered across multiple jurisdictions and obey like the local laws of many different places. Yeah, that's actually a great question. So this is something I'm eager to dig more into, but basically I had a sense check with a professor at Haas, which is like the UC Berkeley Business School about like, corporate jurisdiction. So basically there are a lot of things you can do with corporate jurisdiction or whatever, but there is this notion of basically if you are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, Congress can haul you up in front of Congress. And that is just a really basic sense check that you can do. So we basically looked at a lot of these companies. Are you coming to you know, the US when you're trying to find uh, you know, liquidity, when you're trying to, trying to seek public capital? On these public markets and if you are then you are you're whatever you say whatever you're doing in ireland or you know, whatever not, you know no slight to ireland's tax policy obviously that this is a legal thing to do but it is very commonly done but but you are not an irish company by any means if you are on the new york stock exchange you're on this chart that makes sense also a follow-up question um 
you seem to be saying that the CDNs have a uniform goal across, you know, different populations, but is oh, it right. possible that, you know, they have different services that they give to different sets of users? From yeah, okay, great. Now this is getting into the good stuff. So yeah, they almost certainly have different goals from one another. And those goals probably split on a variety of ways. So um, first way, obviously, I think that the hyper giants who are like vertically integrated, like Google, probably have different goals from, you know, Akamai, who really will just take a customer's data and, and put it around. Um, you know, and I also think that perhaps, you know, Akamai and Cloudflare may have different goals because they serve different market segments. I mean, they have different niches in the market. Let's put it that way. Um, so I think all of that is very interesting to look at. I'm curious where their goals align and diverge and how that matters. And last question, Vesna, we're already running into the break. Hi, um, if you can go to the previous uh, slide number four, just to get away from the other graph. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to bring uh, a point like um, against this, this binary, uh, what do states want and what do CDNs want? What do the end users want, uh, like in the RSC 808090? So like we could be uh, actually the uh, thinking what would be good for the end users. And on the other hand, this also reminds me a lot of colonialism. So if you're going to be colonized by a state or by a corporation, it doesn't matter too much. <laughs> so I question. would like to work on like uh, decolonizing the, the internet and maybe Gaia is a good uh, uh, working group here uh, to think about alternative networks, community owned networks and not only either the state or the corporate networks. I really appreciate that comment. Thank you very much. And I want to make clear, this is not what I believe to be the universe of important things on the internet, OK? <laughs> I agree that we are, should not, we should dream larger than just thinking, do I want corporate control or do I want state control over my life? I would hope for everyone to have more control over their everyday life than that. Thank you for this comment. You know, I do think that this tension is still going to be relevant to people's lives. And if you have any questions, any comments on how you think we might want to uh, be able to do this research effectively, please reach out to me and let me know. Well, from data collection to data analysis to future data analysis, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to the speakers and in particular to the note taker. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, but what I was trying to say is that 